you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here. I, I appreciate uh, Professor Im and, and Keist uh, for this uh, invitation. Um, I hope that this talk um, will, will uh, be uh, uh, accessible to everybody. I, I think it will be. Um, I think the, the question uh, that I want to talk about is a very naive question. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't know much about it, but um, I, you know, I think it's more interesting to talk about problems which, which are more interesting for other people to talk about problems you don't know how to solve than, uh, than problems you do. Um, so um, if you have questions, I hope you'll interrupt me. Um, I, I, I will, if I see something in the chat, I'll try to address it, but I'm, I'm sort of bad when I'm talking at, at, at seeing it. So feel free to interrupt. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is equations uh, where the variables um, are, are elements of uh, a finite simple group. So you sort of see an example of such an equation in the subtitle. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have variables here. They're called x and y. If there are more of them, I'll just call them x1 through xn. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, you have a constant, which is an element of the group. And the question is whether there are elements x and y in the group uh, such that the equation has a solution. So that's, that's the general question that I want to talk about. Uh, so let's uh, see. Uh, so the setup, yes, as I said, G is a finite simple group. We have the variables. Um, we can think of W, if we like, uh, as a word in terms of these variables, but also the inverses of the variables are allowed. And then we have a, a constant, as it were, an element G in G. And we want to know whether this equation uh, can be solved in G. And um, the kind of typical situation that I'm thinking about, uh, I fix the word. And uh, so I fix the left-hand side. And I'm interested in different possibilities for the right-hand side. I mean, um, the kind of best situation would be that, that, maybe I'll go back here. The best situation is for a fixed word, um, there is a solution for, I, I, I mean, of course, it's a matter of opinion what's good and what's bad. But, but what I consider to be the, the normal and good situation is that for all elements G, there will be a solution of this equation uh, where X1 through Xm lie in G. And that can be expressed in this way. You see, the, the element W, the, the word, um, defines a function from G to the N to G. It's not in general a homomorphism, but, but a function which, where you just evaluate W at the N tuple of elements in G, and you, you get a, an element of G. and, and, and uh, as the result, and you want to know whether this is surjective. Uh, and a uh, kind of typical thing which you expect to usually happen, at least I think that that's the, the um, expectation that most people have, is that for most W, what happens is that if G is large enough, uh, this map will be surjective. That seems to be the, 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 the most usual behavior as far as anybody can tell. Um, in fact, if you, if you think about it this way, if, if you think about W as being a, a somewhat uh, kind of a, a randomizing function, you know, it sort of mixes up these group elements in some, in some way that, that's sort of random, which, you know, how good that uh, model is, is, is not clear. But if you think about it in this way, then at least if, if N is bigger than one, then this set G to the N is much bigger than this set G. And so you would expect each element to be hit, you know, probably a lot of times. In fact, you, you would expect approximately the order of G to the power of N minus one solutions for each G. So is, is that true? Okay, before I talk about finite groups, I want to talk about something which sounds harder, but is actually easier, uh, namely what happens for Lie groups. And um, there, is a, there is a big theorem here, um, which is, is due to uh, Burrell in 1983, which says the following. It says, if you have a complex, simple Lie group, whatever that is, and we'll, I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. If you have a complex, simple Lie group, um, and then you think about the map from G to the N to G, then it is almost surjective. Um, technically, the term is dominant. OK, so let me, let me uh, try to explain what, what this means uh, by an example. So uh, let's say that G consists of uh, well, I, I'm already using the letter M, so let me say M by M uh, matrices with determinant one. So you can you can you can express this by saying there's a polynomial equation uh, in the M squared entries of the uh, M by M matrix, which is the equation that the determinant is equal to one, and the solutions of that equation over the field of complex numbers gives you the group SLM of C. Now. 
Um, this is an example of um, an algebraic variety. And I, I think about algebraic varieties here in a very concrete way. You have, you have some variables and you have some polynomial equations. And when you have such a system of equations, you can look for solutions over a given field. And if you think about the variables as being the, the entries of, an, of a matrix, an M by M matrix, then you get a, a, a set of matrices. Now, there's no particular reason in general that these, this should be a group of matrices, but for certain systems of equations, such as the single equation that the, says that the determinant is equal to one, you do actually get a group. And um, so in that case, the evaluation map, which goes from G to the N to G, that evaluation map is actually going to be a morphism of varieties, which basically just means that the variables in the output are polynomial functions of the variables in the input. And what we mean when we say that, that this uh, morphism is dominant is that almost all elements in G lie in the image in the sense that the ones that don't have to satisfy an additional polynomial equation, which most elements in G don't satisfy. So it's a, it's a sort of a special condition not to lie in the image. And if, if you think about this um, from the, set, from the uh, point of view of measure theory, it follows that, that, if you, that the measure of the set of elements which are not in the image is zero. And if you think about it from the set of topology, if you take the closure of the things which are not in the image, that is a closed set without any interior points. So it's, it's sort of a small set. That's what Burrell proved. Uh, for, what makes this sort of interesting is that nevertheless, although the image is almost all of G, it need not be all of G. Uh, so an example that's worth thinking about is N equals one, G is equal to SL2, and the map W is the, given by X squared. It's a squaring map. And what I claim is that the, the matrix minus one, one, zero, minus one has no square root in SL2C. And you can see it in the following way. If you think about this matrix, the eigenvalues are both minus one. And so any square root, the eigenvalues would have to be plus or minus I. And if you want a square root, which is an SL2C, the product of the two eigenvalues has to be one. So one eigenvalue would be I and one eigenvalue would be minus I, which means that the matrix must be diagonalizable which means that its square must be diagonalizable, which this matrix is not. Okay, so this shows that this matrix has no square root and it shows that this map is not always surjective. Now, if we pass from the case of complex simple Lie groups to compact simple Lie groups, the story looks um, rather different. Um, Andreas Tom uh, proved uh, the following thing that um, the image of W, uh, can be arbitrarily small. And, and what this means is that if you fix a compact simple Lie group uh, and you're allowed to choose W, you can choose a word W so that the image lies in an arbitrarily small uh, neighborhood of the identity. On the other hand, if you, if you fix the word first and you allow the Lie group to get very big in dimension, um, my guess is that the, the word map will, will in fact be surjective. When, when it, so I'm looking at just at the case of SUN, but you can look at any simple Lie group of, of big, uh, compact simple Lie group of large dimension. And my guess is that it becomes surjective. I, we don't really have a lot of evidence for this, but what evidence we have seems to me to point in this direction. I, I think it would be a, quite a nice result if we could prove it. Um, okay, now I wanna go back to the case of, of uh, uh, groups, finite groups and um, uh, so I just want to quickly recall the classification theorem. So what are the, what are the finite simple groups? We know now um, the alternating groups. These are the, the first ones discovered, the, the uh, permutations in, in n elements, with, which are even. As long as n is greater than or equal to 5, this is, this is a simple group. And now there's a, a collection of, uh, I think they're more interesting uh, groups, uh, which are said to be of Lie type. And uh, morally speaking, if you forget about these p's, ignore the p for a moment. Morally speaking, uh, the way I think about these groups is um, you have a uh, complex simple Lie group, but instead of plugging in complex numbers, you plug in elements of a finite field. So for example, we talked about SLN, I guess it was maybe M before, but anyway, SLN, we talked about it before. And uh, n by n matrices with determinant one, but instead of making the entries complex numbers, you make them elements of this finite field. Um, instead of SLN, you could look at other uh, simple uh, Lie groups such as SON. 
here the polynomial equations come uh, by thinking about the dot products between rows of the uh, matrix. If the rows are, are distinct from each other, the dot product is zero, uh, and so on. And we know what SON is, and it's going to be expressed polynomially, and so you can plug in FQ. Uh, and then, of course, there, there are the more complicated uh, examples of, of um, Lie groups, uh, of which um, sort of the most mysterious maybe is this thing called E8. In any event, the, re the reason that we put P's here is that if we just look at, for example, SLN FQ, depending on what N and Q are, this may or may not be simple. It may have a non-trivial center. And the P means if it does divide out by the center. In the case of E8, it never does. But in the case of SLN and SON, it sometimes does. So we'll, we'll put those in. And um, then finally, there are 26 exceptions. Uh, the most complicated is the monster, which has more than 10 to the 50th elements. Um, for us, um, it doesn't matter so much because mostly we're interested in things which are true for large finite simple groups. And so I can just assume that they're, they're too big to be sporadic. So that's, that's the classification as far as we're going to need it here. We do not consider cyclic groups of prime order to be simple groups. I mean, they are, I guess. Um, but the theory of uh, polynomial uh, of word equations over cyclic groups of prime order is not an interesting theory. It's a trivial theory. So uh, we're not going to talk about it. And I just want to point out that if you look at the landscape of groups of Lie type, uh, you get a kind of two-dimensional picture like this, which I, I, I think is worth thinking about for a moment, uh, even though it may be what I'm going to say doesn't have mathematical content. It tells you something about maybe how you think about these things. So for example, if you look at SL3, uh, so you're fixing the three, but you're allowing the fields to, to get big, you get this uh, sequence of larger and larger um, groups uh, we don't actually need P in, 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 in the cases that I wrote down. These particular two cases, the center is trivial, but in general, maybe you would include P. Um, but the, the, the point is that, that, I mean, in all of these cases, in this horizontal direction, we have, if you will, nine variables, which are the matrix entries, and one equation, and you're thinking about the system over bigger and bigger fields. And that situation is one which algebraic geometry has something to say about. Um, on the other hand, if we fix the field, for example, F2, and we allow the dimension of the group to go to infinity, that is just something that algebraic geometry doesn't give you any insight into. That doesn't seem that the methods of algebraic geometry, at least any methods that I'm aware of, um, can apply in this situation. And in fact, um, if, you, if you think about, um, I mean, there's a, there's a, I don't know quite, quite what to call it. It's, there's a, an idea floating around. That, there, that one should talk about a field F1. I mean, of course, there is no field with one element, but, but um, th there is a story that people tell about a field with one element. And part of that story is that if you take SLN of the field of one element, you're going to get the alternating group um, uh, AN. So that the sequence of alternating groups could kind of be thought of as the same kind of sequence as this vertical sequence of, of SL3s. Again, algebraic geometry is not going to help you understand alternating groups. What, what will help you sometimes is the character theory, the theory of the irreducible representations uh, of these groups. And character theory helps for all the classes of groups. In the case of alternating groups, um, there's a nice combinatorial story which involves Young diagrams. Um, usually the, the version of Young diagrams that you see in a, in a first course in representation theory, um, they would give representation of symmetric groups, but then you can restrict those representations to alternating groups. Most of the time, they're irreducible. And, and there's a story when they're not. They decompose into two pieces. There's a nice story which enables you to compute the characters of alternating groups. It's, it's more complicated than the story for symmetric groups. Um, for groups of Lie type, there is a much deeper theory, which was um, originally due to Delinia and Lustig. Uh, and the theory was further developed by Lustig. It's a, it's a very deep geometric theory. And it's also very complex combinatorially. But in principle, we do have uh, at least algorithms for computing character groups of uh, all groups of Lie type using this theory. And finally, the uh, sporadic groups, uh, the tables are known. And, and uh, there's a book, um, The Atlas of Finite Groups, which uh, you can find them in, uh, or you can access them through mathematical software like GAP. And, uh, but mostly, we're not so interested in the sporadic groups in this particular top topic, I would say. So that's the, that's the classification. And now I want to say something about words. Um, the, the story that I'm telling 
uh, tonight or this morning for you, um, is not the story I would like to be telling in some sense. Uh, I would like to be saying something about a general theory, but we don't really know anything about the general theory. So instead of um, talking about what happens with general words, I'm going to talk about several different families of words where we do understand what happens. And, and, and what happens is different in the different families and the methods are different. And um, I, I, I would hope that by the study of examples, perhaps a picture of what might happen in the general case could emerge. But this is so early in the story, I think, that um, uh, there's still a lot of guesswork. I, I, I feel that, that, um, that the general theory is still kind of speculative. But let's now talk about uh, primitive words. So a primitive word is an element of a free group which belongs to a basis. OK, so let me just quickly say, uh, what is a free group? So let's say, for example, the free group on generators x and y uh, would consist of all words which are formed out of x's, y's, x inverses, and y inverses, where the only relation is that when a symbol is next to its inverse, you can cancel them. So like y, x, x inverse, y, would be the same thing as y squared. Okay, so, so uh, that's the free group on two generators, and, and, and in n, n generators, it's, a, it's the same thing. Um, just you have more, uh, more symbols uh, to form the, the words. Now, what is, a, what is a basis? So if you have the free group on, n, well, say you have the free group on two generators, a basis would consist of two elements which generate the group. And if you have n elements which generate a free group of order n, then they, it turns out they have no relations between them. There's, a, there's sort of an analogy with, between free groups and, and free abelian groups, like z to the n, where if you had n elements of z to the n which generate the group, then they wouldn't have any relations between them. But uh, there are many, I mean, it's, if you chose a random uh, n-tuple of elements in z to the n, it would have not a big chance, but a, but a, a a non-trivial chance of, of being a basis. And if you choose a random word, it has quite a good chance of belonging to a basis, better than even um, in the, in the, if n is greater than three, I think, and, and, and certainly a positive uh, percentage of, the, of elements, even of c squared, um, uh, belong to a basis, because it's just necessary that the coordinates be relatively prime. Uh, whereas in, in free groups, it's, it's a, a very rare thing. Um, now, let me give you an example, though, where it happens. So if you take the free group on x and y, uh, and you look at the elements x, y, x, and x, y, x squared, y, um, these two elements actually do generate the group. And to show that, all I need to explain to you is how you can express x and y in terms of, of these two words. So let me tell you how you do it. So you start off with this, this element, and you take its inverse, and you multiply on the left with this element. So if we take the, the inverse of this and we multiply it on the left of this, then we'll cancel the x, y, x of this, and you'll just be left with x, y. So that can be expressed in terms of our two generators. But now we can take this x, y and take its inverse and multiply that on the left of x, y, x, and all that remains is now x. Sorry, x. So x can be represented in terms of the two generators we started with. And once we have x and also this element, we can... Uh, divide out by the two x's and get y. Okay, so that's that proves that these two things uh, are are indeed generators, and therefore that they're both primitive. Now, suppose I take two elements in G uh, and look at the system of equations x y x equals G x y x x y equals H. I claim that there is a unique solution in x and y to the system of equations. And the way that you would determine it is you would say, well, because x, y, x is equal to g, therefore uh, x, y is equal to g inverse h. And therefore, we can calculate x by taking x, y inverse and, let, and multiplying it on the left of x, y, x. So we can calculate what x must be, and then we could calculate what y must be. Now, you may say, well, how do we know that that, that seems to show that we have at most one solution. How do we know that, that x and y will work? Well, you can either prove it directly or you can say, look, the total number of uh, possibilities for x and y is the order of g squared, and the total number of possibilities for g and h is the order of g squared. And since there's at most one solution for each g and h, there must be exactly one solution. And what that tells us is that if you just look at the first equation, 
were just interested in x, y, x equals g, then there'll be exactly order of g solutions corresponding to all the possibilities for h. Likewise, if we just look at the second solution, the second equation, there are exactly the order of g solutions. So that's the story for primitive groups. Now at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, I would say, we have the power words. So what is the deal with power words? Uh, a power word is, a, we take a word v, which of course should be non-trivial, uh, and then we put it to the kth power, where k is, is an integer greater than or equal to two. And when we do that, we end up with a word like x, y, x, y. And what we see about these words is that the values of such a word, in the case of, of x, y squared, the value of this word must be a square. It must be a square of some element in G. More generally, the image of a power word consists only of elements which have a kth root. Otherwise, there's no way that your element can be written as V to the K. Now, in the case of K equals two, we actually know that every simple group has an element without a square root. Why is that true? Well, the Height Thompson odd order theorem uh, says that every simple group, yeah, every simple group has even order. And because the group has even order, it must have an element of order two. And the square of that element of order two is the same as the square of the identity. So that the squaring map cannot be one to one and therefore it cannot be surjective if this is a finite group. So that shows that any word of the form V to the K where, where K is equal to two, any such word um, fails to, to give a surjective word map for all G, for all, for all finite simple G. Okay, so those are two, the two kind of extremes. And now let me talk about a situation which is somewhat in the middle, although still uh, uh, maybe a kind of atypical example. So we say that W is a wearing type if it can be written as a product of a non-trivial word W1 and a non-trivial word W2, where W1 and W2 have no variables in common. So for example, we couldn't say x, y, x, y is a wearing type, because if w1 is x, y, and w2 is, is, is x, y, they have two variables in common. Or if w1 is x, and w2 is, is y, x, y, then they still have a variable in common. So th this, these power words are not of wearing type. On the other hand, something like x squared times y squared is of wearing type, because you can write it as a product of words x squared and y squared, which involve disjoint variables. And the reason that this is called wearing type is exactly because of Waring's problem, which involves trying to write numbers as sums of powers. Here it's products of powers. It's a special kind of, of, uh, of word of wearing type. Now, what's, what's very nice about something like x squared, y squared is the following. Uh, and, and this is true in general about w1, w2. If I look at the image of a word map, like w1, I claim that this is always a union of conjugacy classes. So let's think about that in the case of something like x squared. Why is it that the elements which are squares um, consist of a union of conjugacy classes? Why is it that if, if one element is square, all of its conjugates are square? The reason is that if, if we take x squared and we compare that to what we would have gotten if we first conjugated x by something, say z, and then square, it's the same thing as squaring and then conjugating. So if we square and then conjugate. If we have a square and we take a conjugate, it's the same thing as a square of some other element. And that would be true in general for uh, any word. So the nice thing about uh, a situation like x squared, y squared, is that this is going to be a union of products of conjugacy classes. And products of conjugacy classes are relatively easy kinds of sets to analyze in group theory. Right? So if, again, if, if uh, w1 takes a value in c1, and w2 takes a value in c2, then w1, w2 takes every value in c1, c2. So which values are there? Um, oh, okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. But first, I want to uh, mention one other uh, class of examples, of which the, the best example is the commutator word, x, y, x inverse, y inverse. And the theorem here is that uh, in every finite simple group, G, every element is a commutator. When I first saw this theorem, which was shortly after it was proved, my first reaction was, but doesn't everybody know that? I mean, a finite simple group, the commutator group is the whole group. But of course, the point is that the commutator group is the group of products of commutators. 
The fact that every element is, can be written as a single commutator is very, very far from being obvious. In fact, the conjecture goes back to 1951. So it was, uh, yeah, they basically took 60 years to prove it. Depended on classification of finite simple groups uh, very strongly. I will mention that in 1949, uh, the mathematician Goto uh, proved the analogous theorem, uh, not for uh, uh, finite simple groups, but for simple uh, compact Lie groups. So once again, the, the case of, of Lie groups is much, much easier than the case of um, uh, finite groups. OK, so this was, this was conjecture, but all right. And I want to mention a couple of variants of the question. So here's a, a variant. Does every G have a conjugacy class C with C times C inverse equal to G? So if you knew that this question is open, you don't know that this is true, but if you knew that this was true, it would, it would immediately imply Oras conjecture. The reason is the following. If you think about X times Y times X inverse times Y inverse, you can think of this as being X times Y X inverse Y inverse. That is to say X times a conjugate of X inverse. So if you, if you knew that there were a single uh, X whose conjugacy class satisfied uh, this, this uh, formula, then it would be easy to, to see that uh, starting with X's, which are conjugates of this, uh, we would be able to uh, uh, give a new proof uh, of Ora's conjecture. Uh, a more famous question than this one, although, uh, and probably maybe a little bit harder, I'm not certain, uh, goes by the name Thompson's conjecture. And it asks, does every G have a, a class with C squared equals G. Uh, this is also open, although um, the list of groups where it's not known is uh, fairly short. I mean, it's infinite, but uh, it's only some very special cases, uh, although they are, as I say, infinite classes. Uh, finally, let me just mention a, a, an open question. Um, so the commutator word is a special case of what are called Engel words. So in general, an Engel word is a word in in variables x and y, and you get it in this way. You take the commutator of x and y, and then you take that, and you take its commutator with y, and then you take that and take its commutator with y, and you do that k times. And so now the question is, um, uh, is this true that every element in every finite simple group is of this form? Or failing that, can you show that for all sufficiently large finite simple groups, this is true? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe this is accessible. I just don't know. OK, now I want to say something about how you figure out what the product of two conjugacy classes will be. And again, the product of two conjugacy classes will be a union of conjugacy classes. And so the question really, uh, here I, I'm, I'm writing a more general uh, statement, uh, a more, more general. Um, Frobenius considered this question uh, not just for a product of two conjugacy classes, but a product of n minus 1 conjugacy classes. So suppose you have classes from C1 through Cn minus 1, and you want to know whether um, an element in Cn can be written as a product of elements in these conjugacy classes. So in other words, given n conjugacy classes, we're looking for solutions of this equation, where Xn is the product in order of these n minus 1 uh, uh, elements, where each Xi belongs to its proper conjugacy class. So what Frobenius proved is that there is a formula involving the characters of G um, for the, the number of representations, the number of solutions of this equation. And um, you see, I mean, if you, were, if you were to kind of guess naively how many solutions there would be, if you were to try to estimate it, you might reason as follows. Uh, the total number of choices for x1, x2 up to xn is the number of elements in each conjugacy class multiplied together. On the other hand, most of the time, there's no particular reason why the left-hand side should be equal to the right-hand side. They're, they're both elements of G. So you might imagine that there's sort of a one in order G probability that any given n-tuple will actually, any n-tuple of elements of these classes will be a solution of this equation. So if you ignored this complicated expression here and just look at the, the part at the beginning, this is sort of what you, oh, sorry. This is what you might naively imagine uh, would be uh, a good estimate for the number of solutions. Okay. So but what does this term over here mean? We're going to take the sum over all irreducible characters, chi of G, of this expression, where you take the product of character values, and then you divide by chi 1 to the n minus 2. In our case, n is equal to 3, because we have classes C1 and C2, and we're multiplying them and trying to see whether a class 
C3 belongs to the product. So in our case, we'll have a factor of chi1 in the denominator. So this is what the sum looks like. And of course, there's always the trivial character, chi equals 1, and that contributes 1 to this formula. There are other characters as well, and so you have to think about how those characters affect matters, whether, whether the non-trivial characters um, altogether add up to very much. And what often happens is that some of the absolute values of all the terms other than the trivial character can be less than one, in which case, when you take this overall sum, the chi equals one term dominates, and this whole expression has to be non-zero. OK, so then it becomes interesting to find upper bounds. If you think about it, what you want to know is that for non-trivial characters, um, the numerator is sort of small compared to chi of 1. So you, you want character values to be small. And there's a whole technology uh, for getting upper bounds for um, characters of alternating groups, um, as well as group, groups of weak types. So I'll just say a, a little bit about what's, what's known. I mean, there are many results in the literature. Um, I, from my point of view, the strongest results uh, are in a paper that I wrote with Anesha Lev. Um, but depending on what you want, what's strong could be different. I mean, it's, it's not quite fair to say that, that these are the strongest results. They're the strongest results for what, we, what kind of thing that we are interested in. Uh, and here are some sort of typical examples of what we can expect. So if you have an element x um, in the alternating group where the total number of cycles is sort of small compared to n, well, that is to say it's a small power of n, then we can say that the character value, the value of chi of x, at absolute value, is, again, in a logarithmic sense, small compared to chi of 1. This is very nice because if you multiply small a bounded number of small things together, uh, you're going to get something which is small compared to chi of 1. Uh, and then that you have a denominator, which is the power of chi of 1. So you'll end up with uh, each of the terms in, in this expression, would, you hope, would be small then. Um, here's another result. Um, if you have an element where the number of fixed points is small compared to m, it might have a lot of two cycles or three cycles. It might have a lot of cycles in total, but, but it has not a lot of, of one cycles. Then the estimate isn't as good. Um, we see that the absolute value of chi of x is, can be a little bit bigger than the square root of chi of 1. So that gives you some idea of, um, uh, of what's known. And, and in fact, the character formula, the Frobenius formula that I showed on the previous page, is not enough um, to enable you. I mean, you, you have to do other things as well. Though basically, it, it enables you to handle classes x, except those which have a lot of fixed points. You have to do some other technique to deal with classes which have a lot of fixed points. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, I will mention, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, this, is a, this is a misprint. This over here should be an, should be an S. Um, the, the point here somehow is, OK, I mean, if you were to try to prove that when uh, x has a small number of cycles, it is representable uh, as a product uh, C1 and C2, uh, then you would need a, a, a formula like this. But um, maybe that's more detail than I can afford to go into at this time. We're beginning to run below on time. So let me um, move on to groups of Lie type. Uh, here there are a, a number of results. Uh, mostly they're, they're still in preprints. Um, uh, again, the, the flavor of these results uh, has to do with um, so there are elements x in G where character values can be quite large, such as the identity. Uh, so you need to assume something about x to keep the, the character values small. And in fact, if you, if you assume that the centralizer is not too big, then you can get a character estimate of this kind, where C is a positive absolute constant. So for example, if you have a, an element x where the centralizer is smaller than the square root of the order of G, uh, which tends to be typical of al almost all elements in a finite simple group, then you get an estimate like the absolute value is less than chi of 1 to the power of 1 minus C over 2. So that's one kind of estimate. Um, there are other kinds of estimates which, see, I mean, uh, 
And this maybe it, it kind of brings us more deeply into the um, proofs than I want to go. But there are two kinds of elements that come up in, in, these, in these estimates. You see, there are the classes of C1 and C2, which you have some control over. And then there's the class of C3, and you want to be able to hit every class C3. And so, um, so they, they, yeah. So roughly speaking, this kind of bound is useful for C1 and C2, and this kind of bound is, is useful for C3. So you need bounds of both kinds. Um, OK, so there's, there's some statement about um, where you have elements, for example, an element in SLM where the characteristic polynomial has a bounded number of pairwise distinct irreducible factors, then you can get quite a strong uh, upper bound on um, uh, chi of x compared to chi of 1. So these, are, these uh, results, as I say, are, are rather technical, um, but it's the kind of thing you have to do if you want to analyze uh, uh, groups of wearing type. Again, we have a, a liebig shalev type fact, which says that uh, when the rank of your group goes to infinity, the, um, uh, this kind of sum over, over the characters, other than the trivial character of chi 1 to the minus s, goes to 0. OK, and now finally we come to the actual statement. Um, and so the, the uh, statement is, is the following. Um, uh, if W has wearing type, and if G is uh, large enough, then in fact, the word map W is uh, surjective. Um, this result is nice if we just want to show that there is at least one solution. But in fact, um, uh, what I ultimately wanted to show, well, yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, at the time that we proved this result, we were, we were quite uh, happy with it because, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the original question we asked was, um, yeah, is there going to be at least one solution? Um, but what we really expect for most words is something like what I said at the beginning, which is that each G on the right-hand side, you get about the same number of solutions. OK, so let me describe a uh, uh, somewhat later result, in fact, a relatively recent result, again with uh, Shalev and also with uh, um, uh which is the following. So I talk about wearing problem as uh, a word of wearing type, I said, is a word W, which can be written as W1 times W2. Now, if you think about the classical wearings problem in number theory, what is the classical wearings problem? The, the original problem in number theory was, was the following. Suppose you uh, have squares, and you want to re represent every integer as a sum of squares. How many squares do you need? Well, so there's a theorem that it took four squares, and that was known before. I think that was known. Yes, that was known before the time of wearing. But what if you use cubes? So I guess at some point there was a theorem. I don't know whether this was before or after wearing. I guess after that, that you need to, it takes a sum of of nine cubes. I mean, we now don't, we now know that we can do better than nine. But there was a theorem that every positive integer can be written as a sum of nine uh, cubes of integers, and a bigger number, maybe fifty-two fourth powers. So people had pe people had estimates like that. But the number of powers that you needed got bigger and bigger as you looked at higher and higher powers of x. Now, when we sort of switched from thinking about Waring's problem um, in number theory to Waring's problem in group theory, something very surprising happened, which is if you just want to know that there's a solution, sorry, a solution of an equation like this, you just want to know that there's, that there's one solution and if G is large enough, then it's enough that your word W can be written as W1 times W2. So for example, if you look at words of the form X cubed times Y cubed, or words of the form X to the fourth times Y to the fourth, or even X to the a million power times Y to the a million power, if G is large enough, and large enough may depend on what the power is, if G is large enough, then 
uh, every element of G can be written as a product of two million powers in every, every sufficiently large finite simple group. It doesn't require more than two. Now, this uh, 2019 result uh, is quite different uh, in character um, because, in fact, the analogous statement, the, the uh, statement about equidistribution wouldn't be true if we, didn't, if we didn't make an assumption like this. So what we want to do is we want to write, consider sort of strongly wearing words, words which can be written as W1 times W2 times dot, dot, dot times WN, um, where each of the WIs involves a distinct set of variables from any of the others. Those are the kind of words we want to look at. And then the question is, how big does N have to be? And to decide how big N needs to be, what you do is you look at the maximal length of the WIs. So for example, if I say that I'm, that I'm uh, interested in fourth powers, then the maximal length of the WIs would be four, and then I could think how large N has to be. And in fact, N grows, roughly speaking, as the fourth power of the maximal length of the WIs. So with some constant times four to the fourth, um, if N is bigger than some constant times four to the fourth, and we look at a product of uh, N fourth powers, then what we see is that the number of solutions, the number of ways of representing G as a product of, let's say, a million fourth powers, tends asymptotically to G to the power of whatever, 999,999. And this convergence is actually uniform in G as G goes to infinity. Okay, so this is, um, this is the theorem. Now, um, uh, I want to say something about uh, linear algebraic groups. Um, I guess I said something already when I introduced Lie groups. Um, so, a linear algebraic group, again, is, is a, is a subvariety of n by n matrices uh, given by polynomial equations, as I indicated. And I've talked about these two examples, so I think I'm, I'm okay there. Now, when we talk about normal algebraic groups, it makes sense uh, to talk about algebraic subgroups. Uh, and it makes sense to talk about uh, normal algebraic subgroups. And so it makes sense to talk about simple algebraic groups. Um, Another thing which I, I more or less said about algebraic groups, although I didn't say it in this language, is that an algebraic group can be thought of as a functor um, from fields to groups. Uh, now, um, what do I mean by that? I mean, maybe I should just say, um, I plug, once I have an algebraic group, like, like SL3, I plug in a field and I get out a group. Now, uh, the Lang-Ve estimate uh, tells us that the number of points on a variety of dimension n, which is defined over fq, is approximately q to the n, and this approximation gets good if we fix the variety and send fq to infinity. So remember when I drew this picture and I had a horizontal axis where fq is going to infinity and I said you could use algebraic geometry, so this is the kind of algebraic geometry you can use. Now, the implicit constant, when I say O of Q to the N minus a half, is going to depend on the number and on the degrees of the defining polynomial equations, but it doesn't depend on Q. There's a technical point, which is that when I say varieties here, I'm assuming irreducibility, not only irreducibility over FQ, but even over FQ bar, over, uh, algebraic, uh, over algebraic closure. The point is that if a variety has several different components, then each of those components should have about Q to the N points. So, you couldn't expect that q to the n would be the right number. So as an example, the number of elements in SLN of fq, well, the dimension of, of SLN of fq, you can calculate it. You have n squared variables and one equation. So the dimension is n squared minus 1. And so it's q to the n squared minus 1 plus this kind of error term. In fact, we have a, a explicit polynomial formula for FLN of fq, which is better than this, but this illustrates the method. Now, what we can do is, when we are dealing with the case of groups of Lie type, and um, we have a subvariety, well, okay, yeah, when we have a, an algebraic subvariety of G to the M, that is to say we have polynomial equations, um, we can estimate, using Lang-Ve, we can estimate the number of points satisfying this polynomial equation. And the point is that the subvariety that I have in mind is going to be the inverse image 
Remember, I'm trying to solve an equation with g on the right-hand side. And so I can look at all the n-tuples where w evaluated at this n-tuple gives g. That gives me some polynomial equations, and that defines a subvariety x. And I can use lang -V to show that when q is big, there are going to be solutions in this equation. So this gives me a kind of an algebraic geometry uh, approach um, to showing that, that um, yeah, to, to, to showing that my word equation has solutions. So actually implementing this idea uh, is difficult for a couple of reasons. One reason is we have to think about the question of, uh, in, in order to, to apply lang -Ve, we have to know that our variety is non-empty. And so um, we need to know that, that, that in the world of algebraic geometry, which means over an algebraic closure of FQ, there is a solution. So in other words, it's as if instead of solving the equation W of X1 through Xn is equal to G, where X1 through Xm lie in this group G, I try, try to solve the same equation, but I make life easier for myself by working over FQ bar. If I knew that that had solutions, then I would know that this variety X bar was non-empty, and then I could apply lang -Ve. There's another technical difficulty. Is it geometrically irreducible? This is, in general, something which is hard to tell. In some cases, we can, we can check. For example, in the case of wearing, wearing type problems, um, it's not so hard to check the, uh, the issue of geometric irreducibility. OK, so we say that a word w is good for a simple algebraic group if w inverse of g is geometrically irreducible, which means, in particular, it's, it's non-empty for most g. And here's a question that um, I would very much like to know the answer to. Are most words good for all simple algebraic groups? I mean, um, up till now, we've been talking about very special families of groups, which are very, very special families of words, which are rare among the set of all words, let's say all words of length n. So are most words good? If we look at, at all words of given length and take the limit as length goes to infinity, are most words good in the sense that we can use the uh, algebraic geometry method, lang -Ve, um, to show search activity at least along the sort of x-axis of my diagram for finite simple groups? And here is a theorem. For any given g, most words are good. This is not the theorem we want. What we would like is that most words are good for all, group, for all simple algebraic groups g. I just say that if, if, if you give me an algebraic group g, then, um, then most words are good. So that, for example, if you give me the group SL3, then I can say, OK, um, SL3 of, you know, from large finite fields, say f p to the n, as n goes to infinity, um, I can prove um, that I have, uh, for almost all g, I, that I have solutions uh, to my word equation. Uh, so again, this is, this is um, you know, uh, falls short, as all of these results fall short, but it falls short in a slightly different way. All of the other results I talked about today are for, for small classes of words, but the results are pretty good. Here is a result which applies for the majority of words, but it's a very weak result. And uh, I, I see that I am still well within my time. I, I uh, guess I timed this as a 50-minute talk, uh, but, uh, but I am done. And uh, so let me thank you for, uh, for coming. I'm assuming that this is uh, an audience uh, uh, to whom a billion varieties should not be explained, right? I mean, people, people, people know. I mean, uh, or I in, think in general algebra. Uh, probably general algebra, algebraist, or because uh, 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 student, undergraduate and graduate students. Oh, okay. Then I, then I will say. Still here, yeah. Oh. So, of course, many people are the number theorists, but I, I think uh, yeah, there yeah, are yeah. some people. Yeah. So, you can just briefly uh, give the definitions or the background. That would okay. be great. Then that, that's what I'll do. Great. But totally, it's up to you. So. <laughs> You know, I, I don't want, it's sort of silly if you're giving a talk to lose people unnecessarily. So, um, so I, I, I'll try to try to be inclusive. Um, okay, it's uh, 10.50. Shall we start? Sure. Okay. Uh, 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 hello, everyone. Welcome to the second talk of 
uh, Kai's distinguished lectures in mathematics. Uh, the distinguished professor Michael Larson from Indiana University Bloomington is going to uh, continue uh, to talk about the second part of uh, lectures. And the title is Large Fields, Galois Groups, and Abelian Varieties. Let's welcome Professor Larson. So thank you so much. Thank you again for, for this uh, wonderful invitation. It's really uh, such a pleasure uh, to talk to an audience like this. Um, and so I, I will uh, say something about um, well, all, all three topics. Um, so let me uh, begin with large fields, which are which maybe of, of all the three are the ones which need most explanation. Um, so okay, so let's begin with. Uh, so my advisor, my thesis advisor, was, was Faltings, and um, when I began working for him, he had just proved you know the, the, the big theorem which he was famous for, um, and so that was a very exciting time. Um, uh, and it, you know, it's always been. Um, uh, theorem, which I think is one of the, one of the most beautiful theorems in, in number theory, uh, and it says that if you have a number field and if you have a, a curve x over this uh, uh, field, and if the genus of the curve is greater than one, then the number of points um, over the field, the number of points of x uh, which are defined over the field, will be finite. So that's that's what the theorem says, and um, so. Um, a large field is sort of at the opposite extreme from a number field. So what do I mean by that? Um, so, okay, here's the definition. A, a field is large if whenever you have, okay, let me say a non-singular curve, x over k, uh, one of two things is true. Either there are no points on the curve at all, or there are infinitely many. Now, this is, I think, maybe a somewhat strange looking definition. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few examples, and I hope that the, uh, the sense of it will come through when we, when we talk about examples. But I just um, want to say that, um, yeah, that algebraically closed fields, and we're going to be coming to this in a minute, but algebraically closed fields are kind of considered at the top. And you know, prime fields like Q and then. <laughs> Um, or, or the finite field with p elements would be considered at the bottom, like the smallest fields, um, right? And 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 so usually when people do when people do uh, number theory and, and arithmetic algebraic geometry, they think about these small fields. And the whole flavor of what I want to talk about today is is about fields which are which are not too far from being algebraically close. That's really what I want to say. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, an, another equivalent statement for non-singular curves is that, that um, if k is large, then for a non-singular curve, you can't have exactly one point. Um, so it's so maybe a sort of a, uh, a strange criterion. But you see, if you had a, well, I mean, of course, we have one point, then it violates this. But, but if, if you don't have the empty set or, or infinitely many points, then you have finitely many points, and you could remove all but one of those points from the curve. Another thing which I want to say is that there's other terminology in use. Um, so I, I've seen both the term ample and the term anti-mordelic, I guess, in honor of um, uh, the Faulting's theorem, which used to be called Mordel's conjecture. Uh, and there are other terms as well, uh, which are used uh, in the German and French literature on the subject. Okay, so I, I said already that algebraically closed fields um, work. They are, they are large. Uh, R is large. QP is large. That is to say, the field of piadic numbers. If, if you um, ha haven't seen piadic numbers, uh, I mean, I know that there's people from very, very uh, different backgrounds in this audience still. Uh, don't worry about it. It's not going to be uh, essential for the talk. Okay, here's another class of fields. Suppose you have a field uh, which is infinite but in which uh, every element belongs to a finite field. So this is an infinite union of finite fields. Um, and here's another construction. Again, um, you know, if, if, um, if you don't know what an ultra product is, don't worry about it. But if you, if, if you do, then ultra products of finite fields would, would be another, uh, another example. OK. And each of these examples has finitely generated absolute Galois group. 
Um, in the case of, but, so what do I mean by absolute Galapu? What I mean is you take, okay, if you're in characteristic zero, you take the algebraic closure and you take the Galois group of the algebraic closure over your field. If you're in characteristic P, you have to be a little more careful. You have to take the separable closure and take the Galois group, but it's, it's, it's the same idea. Now, of course, in the case of algebraically closed fields, the Galois group, I mean, the Galois, absolute Galois group of an algebraically closed field is trivial. In the case of R, the algebraic closure is C, and the Galois group is just Z mod 2Z, which of course is finally generated. It is a, a non-trivial result, but it's known that for QP, um, uh, this is true. Um, and so in these last two examples, uh, it turns out that the Galois group is what in this context is called cyclic, which by which I, I don't mean that there's a single generator, but what I mean is that when you have a Galois group, you can always think of it as a topological group. And so when I talk about generators, I don't really mean a set of elements which generates the whole group. I just mean a set of generators which generates a dense set. So if you've never thought about um, uh, the topology of infinite Galois groups, uh, again, this is not worth worrying about. Uh, what you can do is instead of going all the way up to the algebraic closure, you can think about all finite Galois extensions. And so if I say that something, if all finite Galois extensions, the Galois group is cyclic, then we say that the um, that the Galois group in the infinite sense is cyclic. Likewise, if, if we want to say that it's finitely generated, then what we mean is that for all finite Galois groups, uh, for, for all finite Galois extensions, the Galois group has a bounded number of generators, independent of which um, finite Galois extension you take. Okay, so, so these, are, these are all examples of large fields, and they are sort of typical examples. Um, Oh, you know, the, before I move on, actually, maybe I should just uh, uh, say something uh, about why, let me just do the case of R. Why is it that R is large? Why is it that if you have a curve over R, uh, which is non-singular and has at least one point, that it has infinitely many points? Because that maybe gives some sense of what largeness is about. So let me give you an example of a curve over R, which has no points at all. The curve is x squared plus y squared equals minus 1. Let me give you an example of a curve over R which has exactly one point. The curve is x squared plus y squared equals 0. However, that point is a singular point. It's sort of strange because it doesn't look like a singular point. It, you know, it just looks like a point. That, but, but if you think about it, if you work over C, you see that x squared plus y squared equals 0 factors as x plus iy times x minus iy equals zero. So it's actually the union of two lines in the complex plane, and only at their intersection point do you have a real point. And so that is in fact that one point over R, although you don't see it if you just look over R, it actually is a singular point. And if, if you have a point which isn't a singular point, then you can use the implicit function theorem to show that there's a whole little interval of points. And of course, a whole little interval is infinite. So by an interval, I don't really mean an interval. I mean, like there's an interval, uh, there, there's like a, a subset of the curve, which is in bijective correspondence to an interval um, on the real line. Okay. Um, so, okay, we've talked about this, this uh, finite generation as being sort of typical of the, the Galois groups um, of, of these large fields. Uh, but in fact, this is not uh, an essential feature. And I want to mention here a, a sort of striking result of, of Collier to them, um, which says the following. So let's assume that the field K is perfect. If you want, just make it characteristic zero and don't worry about it. And then assume that the, the Galois group is a pro P group. So an inverse limit of uh, finite P groups. If this happens, then K is large automatically. And that's true even if this pro P group is not finitely generated. So, I mean, I think, and, and, and it's, it seems to me that, the, the, um, that this theorem and, uh, and the examples um, are suggestive, although they don't prove anything. I think that there is some connection between the absolute Galois group and largeness. Certainly when the absolute Galois group is trivial, 
that, that implies largeness. Um, if it's Z mod two, then the, the field is what's called a, a real closed field, and those are always large. So there does seem to be some kind of connection, and, and all pro P groups are large. So there does seem to be some kind of connection. Um, uh, let me just mention a technical point uh, uh, for the experts. When, uh, if K is not necessarily perfect, um, then it's, uh, Yardin was able to extend this result. Uh, and, and the same thing is true. That, that if the Gala group of KSEP, the separable closure of K over K is, is pro P, then K is large. Okay, now there's a conjecture, um, which is certainly in, in the spirit of, of um, the philosophy that I tried to, to indicate, that there's a connection between Gala group and, and largeness. So the conjecture by uh, Königsmann is that if you have an infinite field, at least, and, um, and this Galois group is finitely generated, then K is large. Um, okay, let me move on to um, uh, this result of Fame and Peterson, um, which, uh, but before I do that, I, I had it. Um, yeah, so I, I want to say something about abelian varieties uh, because, um, yeah, I mean, this an essential point in this talk is abelian varieties. I'm assuming everybody knows what a Gala group is. I've explained largeness, but I haven't explained abelian varieties in my slides, and I and I should have done so. I was thinking of this as a seminar talk that would only be attended by faculty, basically, and that was uh, I should have checked about that. And so, uh, let me say something about what an abelian variety is. First of all, if you know what an elliptic curve is then you know about sort of the, the one-dimensional version of the billion varieties, which is maybe the, the most important single case. Um, so in general, what, is, what an abelian variety is, is it's a kind of projective variety which has a group structure. So for me, a projective variety means something which, um, uh, first of all, is given in projective space by homogeneous polynomial equations. So I talked in my previous talk about affine varieties, so that then you just have n variables and you have some polynomial equations and you look at the solution set. Projective varieties, I would have, if, if I'm dealing in projective n space, I would have n plus one variables, they're homogeneous coordinates, and then the equations would, would, would be uh, homogeneous polynomials. And, and, um, but for me, being a, a, a projective variety also means that I assume irreducibility. And now it's a theorem, and it's, it's by no means a, a, an easy theorem. It's not terribly hard either, but it's, it's certainly not obvious. But if you have a group structure on a projective variety, then it has to be a billion. This is very nice because there, there are very nice uh, examples, which I've talked about in my previous talk, of um, affine varieties, of, of, of varieties um, um, just given by polynomials in n variables, which, which give groups which are not commutative, like SL2, right? I mean, SL2 is given uh, in terms of the matri matrix entries A, B, C, D by A, D minus B, C equals one, uh, and it's a non-commutative group. But in, in projective space, it has to be commutative, interestingly. Okay, so that's what, a, that's what an abelian variety is. And so there's, there's a big theorem about abelian varieties over number fields. Um, so, the, the theorem is called the, the Mordelvay theorem, and it says the following thing. It says that if you look at the points on your abelian variety over a number field, that, that of course is a group, this group will be finally generated. This is kind of the big fact about abelian varieties and number theory. I mean, of course, there are deeper facts about abelian varieties and number theory as well, um, but this is sort of the starting point without which the whole theory falls apart. Uh, whereas, for example, if you have an abelian variety over an algebraically closed field, um, generally this is not true. It's generally not. Um, yeah. So the, the uh, theorem that uh, Fame and, and Peterson proved is that if you have a large field, which is not locally finite, and I think I wrote something wrong on the previous slide. Um, yeah, I... I, I uh, this is sort of a note that, that I added at the last minute, and I didn't think about what I was writing. This is not a true statement. So, um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. What I wrote is right. Okay, I just, okay. I, I understand now what I, what I was saying. Yeah, okay. I, I uh, Yes. The reason that Koenigsman made this qualification 
is that finite fields have Galois groups Z hat, which is cyclic, right? And so they had to exclude finite fields. But they don't exclude locally finite fields. Locally finite fields are large. However, we have to exclude the locally finite fields as well from this famed Peterson theorem. If K is large but not locally finite, then they prove that every non-trivial abelian variety has infinite rank over K. And let me say philosophically why this is true. The difficulty when you're trying to prove infinite rank is to find a big source of points under abelian variety. Of course, once you've found infinitely many points, you need to show that they're independent of each other, right? I mean, it's more, there's more than one step. But the hard part is to find a source, an infinite source of points under a billion variety. And the nice thing about largeness is that, um, yeah, that your abelian variety is absolutely guaranteed to have infinitely many points on it if, if your field is large. Why is that true? Well, roughly speaking, it's true for the following reason. Um, your abelian variety is supposed to be a group, which means it has an identity. So the identity is a point. And now what you can do is you can um, find a curve on the abelian variety which passes through this point and is non-singular at the point. You can use Bertini theorems if you know a little bit of algebraic geometry to do that. So you find a curve in the abelian variety through the point, and now you have a non-singular point on the curve, and so now the, the largeness tells you you have lots of, lots of k points on that curve. So, of course, once you've found these points, you have to worry about whether they're linearly independent. And that's not a trivial fact, because in fact, in the case of locally finite fields, every point on the abelian variety is a finite order. This is kind of a weird thing. Uh, if you think about the case, let's say, of uh, let's take the finite field FP and take its algebraic closure, FP bar. Now, this is a large field because it's algebraically closed. But if you think about an abelian variety over FP bar, if you have any point on this abelian variety, in fact, it has only finitely many coordinates because in projective space, you know, we're talking about a projective variety with finitely many homogeneous coordinates. Each of those coordinates is in FP bar, but every element of FP bar lies in a finite field. And so any finite collection of them lies in, in a, a common extension of these finite fields, which is again a finite field. And if you look at an abelian variety over a finite field, it only has finitely many points. So every, if we look at K, which is locally finite, then every point on AK will be a finite order. And so the fact that there are infinitely many of them doesn't enable you to find even one linearly independent point, let alone infinitely many. So you need some other tool, and that tool is, is, um, is Hilbert irreducibility. Um, and I probably won't have time to talk about that, but maybe if I have time at the end, I'll say a few words about how Hilbert irreducibility comes into this picture. OK. However, the Koenigsmann conjecture implies the following. If we start with a field which isn't locally finite, and if, if this locally finite thing bothers you and it confuses you at all, just make k be of characteristic 0 from now on, and you never have to think about it again. And then you don't have to worry about k sep. It's just k bar. So if k is, is not locally finite, and, and gk is the absolute Galois group, and this is finitely generated, in this funny sense that there's a finite collection of elements which generates a dense subgroup in GK, or equivalently that every finite Galois extension, Gal L over K, um, has a bounded number of generators independent of what L is. Under that hypothesis, our, our, the conjecture is that every A over K has infinite rank. That's the conjecture. So I made this conjecture before uh, Fan and Peterson proved their theorem. And, but, but now this conjecture sort of became part of, of the general story of what people expect in the world of large fields. OK, now, uh, so I claim that we can find lots of points in A of K um, in each of these cases using different kinds of machinery. Um, I already talked about the, uh, the case K equals R. Uh, where in effect, in effect, we use the implicit function theorem. When k is equal to k bar, we use the Mostanzatz. When k is equal to qp, if you know how that works, we use Hensel's lemma. Um, and in the last couple of cases, we can use the lang weyl estimate, which I talked about in the previous talk. So the techniques that you use to get these points are different for the different classes of fields. But in each of these sort of very famous uh, examples of large fields, um, we, we can see where the points on A are coming from, uh, whether or not we can show that they give infinite rank. 
So as I said, Hilbert irreducibility uh, for a, a suitable subfield K0 of K is the key technical thing, which at least in the first three cases guarantee that you really will have infinite rank. Okay. There's a, a more general version of the conjecture, which can be formulated in the following way. This is um, uh, maybe, a, again, something which is um, maybe not central to the rest of the talk. So, so it, if this is confusing, don't worry about it too much. But, uh, but I, I do think it's an interesting conjecture. So if we start off with a field which is not locally finite, but the absolute Galois group is finally generated, then not only, um, okay, so what, we, what can we do? What we can do is we can take uh, the points on, of A over the separable closure of K and turn it into a vector space over C by tensoring over C. Okay, now the Galois group acts on the coordinates of these points because this GK is just the Galois group of K-sep over K, so it acts on the coordinates. So it, GK is a group of automorphisms, well, acts as automorphisms on this uh, A K sep, and therefore it acts linearly on this, on this complex vector space. It also acts continuously. And you can ask, what, what is this representation? And so it's not difficult to see that the representation will be a direct sum of irreducible representations, irreducible complex representations of GK, each of which is continuous. Um, and so the conjecture is, Ooh. The conjecture is that every irreducible complex continuous representation appears with infinite multiplicity. If you think about the trivial representation, the trivial representation appearing with infinite multiplicity exactly means that when we take A of K, that has infinite rank. So this tells you that not only does the trivial representation appear infinitely many times, all complex continuous irreducible representations appear infinitely many times. That's the, that, that's the conjecture. Okay, now I want to um, uh, kind of go back from these kind of very general considerations to something extremely concrete. So I want to start with um, a cube root of unity and a, uh, an extension of Q, which I'll call K, which, is, uh, which contains a, this cube root of unity. And um, this extension is a very big extension. I'm going to assume that it's generated by a single element sigma. So you should think of k as being just a little smaller than the algebraic closure of this field. So the algebraic closure of this field is the same as the algebraic closure of q. So you should think of this as being just a, a, a slightly smaller field in the sense that you take a single automorphism and you take the fixed field of the algebraic closure of this by the single automorphism sigma. Okay, so that's that's the kind of field K. These, are, these fields are hard to describe in general, unless sigma is something like complex conjugation, which actually it won't be because we're assuming that omega is, is in this field. It's hard to actually write down an example of a field of this kind, although you can. Uh, actually, I'm not so sure you can. Maybe you can. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to consider an elliptic curve, which depends on two parameters, A and B. And A and B are elements of K. And the curve, I'm going to write it as Y squared equals X minus A, X minus B, X minus omega A, X minus omega B. And I should say that usually when you see an elliptic curve written down explicitly, it's Y squared equals a cubic in X. But it is actually true that if I take Y squared equals a degree four polynomial in X, that is also an elliptic curve. Another thing is I said elliptic curves were, were a billion varieties and a billion varieties are projective. So I'm lying slightly. This is not really the elliptic curve. It's just um, the, an affine piece of the elliptic curve. OK, so if you think about this elliptic curve, uh, it depends on the parameters a and b. But it's easy to see that if I multiply a and b by omega, I'll get an isomorphic elliptic curve. I mean, you can write down an, an isomorphism very easily. Um, basically multiplying x by omega and y by omega squared, you get an isomorphism. And, and likewise, there's an isomorphism with omega squared a and omega squared b. And, okay, if I choose any element c in k, and I'd rather not choose a or b or omega a or omega b or omega squared a or omega squared b, 
But if I choose any element C and K, then what I can do is I can plug C into these polynomials. I can take C minus, OK, well, I'm going to do this as I goes from 0 to 2, C minus omega I to the IA, omega to the IB, and so on. Basically, when I is equal to 0, you see that I'm just getting what I would get if I plug uh, C for x. But I'm going to do that for 0 and for 1 and for 2. And if I multiply those three things together, then I claim that, in fact, I'm always going to get a perfect square in K. And the reason is that in total in this product, there are, well, there are going to be 12 terms appearing. But in fact, each term appears twice. So for example, if I think about C minus omega A, that appears when I is equal to 0 as this term. And it appears, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I did that wrong. If I take C minus omega A, it appears when I equals 0 as this term, and when I equals 1 as this term. So if you, if you check, you see that of the 12 terms in this product, there are really just six different ones, each of which occurs twice. And so when I multiply it all together, I'm going to get a perfect square in K. And so when I take the square root of that, I'm going to get an element of K. And so what I'm claiming is that in fact, sigma fixes some expression of this kind. Why is that true? Well, I'm multiplying together three, three elements, and I'm getting a square. So if I take their square roots, I can multiply together three square roots. Um, and so I'm going, to get, uh, I'm going to get something in k. Now, if you think about sigma, uh, it sends every square root either into itself or into its minus. Right? I mean, um, sigma sends this element to itself. So it's got to send the square root either, either to the square root itself or to minus. And if you have, if you have three square roots and you, and you multiply them together and you get, get something which gets sent to itself, then at least one of those square roots has to be sent to itself. In other words, if you have three, three elements and they all get sent to minus themselves, then the product gets sent to minus itself, which is not the case here because the square root of this expression is in K. So I didn't say that very well, but that's, that's the situation. OK. So that's, so why is that good? The reason it's good is I've now succeeded in finding a C, which is in K, and this square root is in K, which means I've succeeded in finding a point on one of these three elliptic curves with the x coordinate of C and the, the y coordinate given by this formula. But since these curves are all isomorphic to each other, in fact, I found a point on this EAB. And there are infinitely many Cs I could use. So I now have a machine for producing points on these elliptic curves. This is kind of like the original idea of how to do this, which we later kind of figured out how to abstract. Um, so here's a kind of an abstract way of, of thinking about what's going on. Uh, it's certainly not obvious, at least not obvious to me, um, that, that what I just said is a special case of this construction, uh, but it is. And if, if you're the kind of person who, who likes to think abstractly, this may be easier to understand than this uh, concrete uh, construction that I just gave. So I want to start off with the following situation. I've got a group G acting on a lattice Z to the N. And because it acts on Z to the N, I can also make it act on A to the N. Right? If I have a, an integer matrix, I can actually if I have a column vector of elements of A and I have an integer n by n matrix, I can just multiply them and get a new column vector of elements of A. So we actually have a, an action of, Z to, of G on A to the n coming from its action on Z to the n. And now I want to say that the group of G, I want to assume that the group of G covariance on Z to the n is torsion. I'll remind you in a minute of what covariance are. But for every homomorphism from the absolute Galois group to G, the group of phi of GK covariance has a factor of Z. So let me just remind you that if you have a group action on an abelian group, then the invariance are all, is the maximal subgroup that G acts trivially on, and the covariance are the maximal quotient group that G acts trivially on. And so in this case, when I say that the group of G covariance is torsion, I could just as well have said it's finite. But the, the, G, the phi of GK covariance will always have a factor of Z. 
And then I also assume that y is a curve sitting inside a to the n, which is stable under the action of g, in, not in the sense that each point on the curve gets mapped to itself by every element of g, but the curve as a whole uh, gets mapped to itself by every element of g. Great. Suppose I have all this data. I mean, this is a, a lot to ask, but if I have all this data, and in addition, the quotient of y by the action of g is a rational curve, then there's a construction, which generalizes the construction in the previous slide. What do I do? I take c belonging to this rational curve, x. Now, x is a quotient of y by g. So I choose a, an element of y which maps into, into this x. I call it c tilde. It won't usually be defined over k. It'll just be defined over the separable closure of k. And now I'm going to define my homomorphism phi uh, according to the action of the Galois group on C tilde. You see, if you've got a point in the ground field on X, and you have a point which lies over it on Y, which is not in the ground field, and you let the Galois group act, the Galois group is going to commute, is going to permute the po points in the fiber of Y lying over X, which means that it will take any element in this fiber and map it to another element in the fiber, which is the same as applying some element in G. So we can define phi exactly by this formula. This just says what I said. But we have any element of the Galois group, hit the curve on Y with it. That's the same thing as taking phi of tau and hitting the curve C tilde by the action of G uh, by, phi by phi of tau. So that, uh, that defines a phi of tau. And we apply this formula over here for this phi of tau. What do we say? We say that we can map C of tau to A of K. Yeah, so, I mean, this business of having a factor Z for phi of K covariance exactly means that there's a map from A to the N to A, which is phi of GK stable. All right, I mean, this slide, it, it maybe, maybe I, I should have um, broken this up because I see that there's really a lot in this, in this idea. But anyway, this, this, um, Construction uh, can be applied in, in fairly concrete situations. Uh, so let me give an example. Um, suppose we fix a, an integer n, and we look at, so here actually, instead of z to the n, I'm gonna look at, at z to the two n minus one. So my n here is not the same as my n here. Okay, so I, I want to look at all two n tuples of integers with some zero. That gives me a free abelian group of rank two n minus one. And I can look at the action of the alternating group on these two n tuples, which sum to zero. And what I claim is that the group of covariance is finite, because if I think about the action of the alternating group on, on, this, um, on this lattice of rank two n minus one, if I tensor with Q, I get an irreducible representation of degree two n minus one. So no, no covariance at all if I tensor with Q. Um, again, if, if the fact that this is uh, an irreducible representation of the alternating group um, that maybe takes a little bit of thought, the fact that it's an irreducible representation of the symmetric group is, is sort of a standard fact, right? The permutation representation of a symmetric group decomposes into a trivial representation and a, an irreducible representation of one lower degree than the size of the permutation group. And it's that, one lower degree representation, which is arising in our story. And therefore, the group of covariance is torsion. On the other hand, if you take any homomorphism from GK to, two, to 2N, GK is topologically generated by sigma. And so we're going to, by abusive notation, we're going to, instead of calling sigma an element here, we're going to call it the image of this element in A2N, which is, of course, an even permutation. And an even permutation in A2n cannot be a 2n cycle because a 2n cycle is odd. So it's got to break up into at least two orbits. And the sum of the values in this 2n tuple over any single cycle defines a map from this z2n minus one to z, which is stable by sigma. But that is the, that is the construction. And using this construction, um, uh, uh, Bohe M and I uh, we're able to show that if 
where k is a field which doesn't have characteristic two and it's not locally finite. And if gk is cyclic, then every a over k has infinite rank. So there are two reasons that this falls short of our desired result. One is that uh, we, I said here that the characteristic is not two and that, that shouldn't be part of the story. We shouldn't need to exclude two, I don't think. Um, the other thing is we say that GK is cyclic and we really just wanted to say it's finally generated. So this is only the one generator version. We would like to do this for, for the end generator case, but we don't know how to do that. Okay, so this, uh, I mean, in the, in the last two slides, I sort of sketched the idea behind this proof, although I, I um, yeah, I mean, it, I think the rest of the talk will be easier than this. This is uh, probably the most technical uh, thing I intend to do. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is a totally different approach, um, which uh, I will apply mainly in the case of elliptic curves, although some special cases of the billion varieties. So let me mention uh, two results from combinatorics from uh, the subject of Ramsey theory. One is called the van der Verden theorem, and it says that if you have a finite coloring of the natural numbers, by finite coloring, I really just mean a partition into finitely many sets, which I think of as colors, but um, but that's not, of course, important. Then at least one of those sets <coughs> will contain an arbitrarily long arithmetic progression, which I would describe by saying there are arbitrarily long monochromatic arithmetic progressions in this coloring. That's the van der Verden theorem. A more modern result of the same sort of flavor is the Hales Jewett theorem, and it says the following. If you fix an integer m, positive integer, and c, which is the number of colors, then there exists d such that any c coloring, that is coloring involving c colors, of the d-dimensional cube of side n has a monochromatic combinatorial line. Okay, I realize that's a lot uh, of words. Let me uh, show you a picture. Okay, here n is equal to four, d is equal to two, so it's a, it's a square rather than a cube of side n, and c is equal to three. Now, actually, I don't think d equals two would work in general. I think that there would be some way that I could color this four by four square so that there wouldn't be a monochromatic line, but I gave three examples of monochromatic lines, the three kinds that there are in this case. There's the vertical line, the horizontal line, and the diagonal line. And um, going from here to here to here to here does not count as a line. So um, what's important to have a line is that every coordinate is either fixed or advances one step at a time with all the other coordinates which aren't fixed. So 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4 counts as a line, but 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1 does not count as a line in the hale stewart theorem. Okay. Uh, and so uh, what uh, M and I proved uh, was that if K is a characteristic zero and GK is finitely generated, we do not insist that it be cyclic. This is the, the, the strength of this result. Um, and if we, if we look at uh, points A1 through, I mean, uh, elements A1 through A2 G plus two, so G is an integer greater than or equal to one. And so we take an even number uh, four or more of pairwise distinct elements of K and then we look at the curve, y squared equals this product. This is, uh, I would call it a split hyperelliptic curve over k. And the claim is that this curve has infinitely many points over k. Now, of course, the Koenigsman conjectures that this hypothesis uh, guarantees that the field is large and therefore that this would have infinitely many points because of course, if I plug in x equals a1 and y equals zero, that's a point, and it, it turns out it's a non-singular point. Uh, so in this way, we can, we can show, if we believe the Koenigsman theorem, that, that, I mean, this would be an immediate consequence, that this would have infinitely many points. Um, but we actually proved it. Um, so um, let me say something about how we deduced it from these combinatorial results, and I'm going to do it in a very special case. I'm going to do it in the case where, um, a1 is minus one, a2 is minus two, all the way up to a2g plus two is minus 2g plus two. 
So this becomes the curve y squared equals x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3, x plus 4, and so on. OK, and now what I, what I want to do is I want to color each natural number by its class in the multiplicative group of k, modulo the multiplicative group of k squared. OK, now why is this a finite coloring? Why is this quotient group a finite quotient group? So when you talk about squares, or, or when you talk about elements of k cross, a multiplicative group of k, for each such element, you can take a square root. Right? If I have a, 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 an element of the multiplicative group of, of k, I can take its square root, and I can adjoin that to k. Now, what field do I get? If I take two different elements, which are in the same class, modulo squares, they'll give me the same, the same class, the same quadratic field. Well, of course, I might have something which is in the same class as 1. I might have something which is a perfect square, in which case I'll get a, a, a trivial extension. If I, don't have, if I have something which isn't a square, I'll get a quadratic extension. But which quadratic extension only depends on the class here. And the point is that because GK is finitely generated, there can only be finitely many quadratic extensions. Because if you have many quadratic extensions, you can get a, um, yeah, I mean, you can get a Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2, you know, many, many times extension. And then K, K bar is an extension of that. So you get a surjective map from, from GK to Z2 cross E2 cross E2, as many copies as you want. And that, that isn't supposed to exist because GK is finitely generated. So there's got to be a bounded number. Another way of saying it is that this follows from Kuhlman theory. There's got to be a bounded number of classes here. So this gives me a finite coloring of, uh, of, of natural numbers. And now what I can do is I can say, well, what happens if I have an arithmetic progression which are all the same color. An arithmetic progression whose length is equal to 2g plus 2. So I look at this. I have a plus d, a plus 2d, uh, a plus 2g plus 2d. I have 2g plus 2 terms in arithmetic progression, and they all have the same color. Having the same color, remember, means that, that they're in the same class in the multiplicative group of k, modulus squares. And so if I divide each of them by d, the color may change, but they'll still be they'll still be in the same class modulo squares. Right? If you have um, these things are, are all different coset representatives mod squares, and so if I multiply you know, divide them by the same number, that, that will still be true. And if I divide by d, I'm going to get these numbers. Right, and they're all in the same class. And I claim to, that if you multiply together an even number of elements which are in the same class of a group of order uh, which is um, uh, killed by two then I'm going to get something trivial. Right? If I multiply together a, a bunch of things which are in the same class modulo squares, and the number of those things is even, then the result is a perfect square. And so I've succeeded in finding a value of x and the a over d, which, um, again, is making this special assumption about a1 through a, a2g plus 2, I've succeeded in finding um, a, uh, an element of x for which, well, I, I, would, I would take the square root of this expression and get an element of k, which would be my y value. So I have a machine for producing points on this. And again, by the standard kind of methods that we use, um, we can use this machine to show that uh, the rank is infinite. Uh, well, no, right now I'm just asserting that the, that the number of these points is infinite. But as a corollary, um, if, if g is equal to 1, so that we actually have an elliptic curve, then we can show more than that the number of points is infinite. We can show that they generate a group of infinite rank. Uh, if the AIs uh, are not in the rational numbers, then we need to use hales jewett instead of van der Berg, but it's essentially the same argument. And if g is greater than 1, then we get a curve of higher rank. And if you know the construction of Jacobian varieties, um, then we can prove uh, we can prove infinite rank um, for these Jacobian varieties, which are a special kind of abelian variety of higher dimension. So it's, it's, um, it's by no means the case that we can sh show a result like this for most kinds of higher dimensional abelian varieties. But if you think about this for elliptic curves, it's not so bad. You have to make an assumption on the elliptic curve, which amounts to the assumption that the two torsion group is defined over k. 
but then we can then we can prove uh, infinite rank uh, even when Jake when when uh, the Gala group is not cyclic but just finally generated. Also, we don't uh, need to really to assume characteristic zero, although we don't know how to do it in characteristic two. Okay, now I'm going to talk about um, uh, something different. I don't seem to have a title for this slide. Um, yeah, I, I want to say something about. Uh, see how much time I have left. I I have a little less than fifteen minutes left. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to say something about applications of analytic number theory, and I'll be very quick about this because it's maybe the least um, developed of these methods. Um, but suppose we start off with an elliptic curve, and I'm going to write the elliptic curve in the more familiar form, y squared equals a cubic in x, rather than a quartic, which is, has been useful before in this talk. And I'm going to uh, assume that it's defined over some field uh, k0, which is contained in k. Now, uh, the point here is this. If I start off with a field k, which is large, but I take just a finite number of elements, in this case, two elements from k, then I can find a finitely generated subfield, namely generated by a and b, where this elliptic curve is defined over that finitely generated subfield. So it's sort of convenient, uh, instead of, it's sometimes convenient to have a finitely generated field because we know a lot more about finitely generated fields than we do about these large fields. And so we can think of the elliptic curve as being defined over k0, even though we're looking at points over k. Okay, now suppose we have, uh, uh, well, so we can look at uh, our field multiplicative group of k0 modulo squares. Um, this is, a, of course, a group in which every element is of order 2, except for the identity. So we can think of it as a vector space, an infinite dimensional vector space over the field with two elements. And I can take a, an n-dimensional subspace. And I can choose representatives of the non-zero vectors. There are only two to the n minus one of them, the non-zero, the representative of the non-zero elements. So just as an example uh, of what to think about, um, let's say that k0 is, is the rational numbers. Um, then we could look at the case where v1, and n is equal to two, let's say. We could look at the case where d1 is, is two, d2 is three, and d3 is six. So one, two, three, and six are representatives of a two-dimensional subspace of the multiplicative group of Q modulo squares. Okay, and now this, the uh, statement is the following. If, uh, so there's a concept of, of a quadratic twist of an elliptic curve. And if I know that for each twist of, of my elliptic curve E by one of these Ds, if I know that all of those twists have positive rank, and I know that this group G, the Gala group uh, of k sep over k, if I know that this is n minus 1 generated, it can be generated by n minus 1 elements, then E has positive rank over k. This is not a hard theorem. Um, I think uh, I am not going to uh, explain the proof, but the proof is really two lines long if you, if you uh, think carefully about what it says. Um, now, if we start off with a case that k0 is a number field, and e is an elliptic curve over k0, and n is a positive integer, um, then my, the conjecture is, our conjecture is, that there exists an n-dimensional subspace of uh, this F2 vector space, and coset representatives, as I described before, such that E of di has positive rank uh, over each one, over k0 for each of these i's. That's conjecture. We don't know that it's true. But it would immediately follow from the following more general conjecture, which is if you have a number field and elliptic curves uh, over the number field and a positive integer, um, well, where, where n is a positive integer, so you have n elliptic curves, then there exists d so that you can simultaneously twist E1 through En by the same D, and each one of them will have positive rank over K0. Now, let me just say that this conjecture, this lower conjecture, implies the upper conjecture. And the upper conjecture 
uh, would imply um, this, uh, that we can construct uh, a point in E from this n-dimensional subspace. And we can repeat this construction. So we would, in fact, be able to prove infinite rank if, if we knew how to prove this conjecture. Unfortunately, we don't know how to prove this conjecture. What is known is the following. If you have an elliptic curve over Q and any epsilon greater than zero, then if you look at twists by integers up to n, at least n to the one minus epsilon of these twists by integers from one to n will have positive rank. So I mean, a way of thinking about that is that the probability of, of positive rank is at least one over n to the epsilon. And we can make epsilon as small as we want. So it should be, morally speaking, that if we want to have several elliptic curves which, where the twists are simultaneously um, of positive rank, it should be possible to do if you kind of use the uh, heuristic that the positivity of the rank, that these are independent conditions. But of course, we don't know that they're independent. And so the pirelli pomacala theorem doesn't uh, by itself imply this conjecture and therefore apply the theorem we want. Still, um, I think it's very tempting to wonder whether this um, pirelli pomacala business uh, can in fact be, be adapted to, to uh, attack the previous conjecture, which would then enable us to prove infinite rank, um, uh, even if uh, GK it has many generators. Again, only for elliptic curves, but still, elliptic curves over number fields, that's sort of the most interesting case. Um, yeah, I mean, so um, M and I did, did prove something in this direction, um, well, something in the direction of the conjecture. Somehow in the, in the um, yeah, I mean, it's very weak, right? I mean, basically what we said is given N, we can find an elliptic curve and an N-dimensional subspace such that all of these twists have positive rank. So it's like, um, if we get to, you get to choose N, but we get to choose E, and we get to choose the subspace. Well, we, always, we would always get to choose the subspace. The theorem we want would be that E is chosen, that you choose E and you choose N, and we'll give you the subspace. And this, this theorem is weaker because you choose N, but then we choose E to work for N. We don't, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not, it's not as nice. So, but that's what we can prove. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, I see what's happened. Uh, yes, okay, I understand. I, I've been cutting off the tops of my slides. Okay, finally, I want to say something about Hegner points. Um, so if in this very special case that the elliptic curve is defined over Q, uh, then the modularity theorem, which used to be the Shimura-Taniyama conjecture, implies that there is a modular parameterization, a non-constant map from the modular curve X naught of N to E, where n is the conductor of e, whatever that is, it's an invariant of the elliptic curve. And so what that means is that um, if we take points on this modular curve corresponding to CM elliptic cur curves, then we get points on e, which are defined over suitable class fields. And these are called he Hegner points uh, on e, e. So in, in other words, in this very favorable situation where we have an elliptic curve over Q, we do have a supply, in fact, an infinite supply of points which are on E, which are defined over well understood number fields um, containing Q. And um, so what, uh, what M proved was that in fact, if E is defined over Q and, and the Galois group is cyclic, then not only do we know, as, as we said before, that, that E of K uh, is an infinite rank she proved something stronger, which is subgroup, which is sort of uh, understandable in the sense that it comes from geometry, from these Hegner points. That also has infinite rank. And um, I mean, to me, this is very intriguing. I, I, I you know, um, all the other constructions that I talked about uh, today, um, we don't really know where the points are coming from. Uh, I mean, in some sense. Um, but here, these points are, are sort of given to us by arithmetic. And so for me, this is a very, um, very satisfactory result. Again, the weakness is we have to assume sick. Finally generated would be what we would really like. Um, 
Uh, and the last thing I'll say, and this is not something that, that um, either of us was involved in, um, the uh, Dachschitz brothers um, showed that uh, if a elliptic curve is defined over a number field with at least one real place, so that would include the case of Q, um, then if we assume the burst winner and dire conjecture, then the rank of E over K is infinite. And this result, I should have said it and I didn't say it, this result works in the general finally generated case. So it doesn't assume cyclic. However, it has the disadvantage that it does assume the burst winner and dire conjecture. So um, of course, the fact that this theorem is true, assuming burst winner and dire is very strong evidence that it should be true, but there's still additional hypotheses, either the existence of a real place or in the totally imaginary case, they can do it by assuming a non-interval J effect. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you for coming to the talk. <laughs>